Hello everyone and uh, welcome uh, to the fourth and final session. I'll just wait a second for the connection to stabilize. And I'll just kindly ask everyone to, to mute their microphones unless you're speaking for now so we can try and make sure that we've got a, a really strong connection. So welcome, as I said, to the fourth and final session of, of these webinars for national human rights institutions on the subject of the implementation of judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. The fourth session concerns writing effective Rule 9 submissions, and I'll be very helpful, uh, very happy rather, just to give you some uh, introductory remarks and set out the agenda for today's session. So we're going to start off with, with a couple of comments uh, from me just to recap the things that have been said in the training video that was sent to you by Nikos Staropoulos, um, uh, Head of Division in the Department for the Execution of Judgments. If you haven't seen that video, I, I do recommend that you you watch it, there's some good lessons to be learned there about the effective writing of Rule 9s. So we'll have that, we'll have a bit of an open discussion. Now's the time, I think really everyone just to, to share your comments and uh, it'd be very interesting to hear from all of you if you have any questions uh, about uh, this subject matter. Please put your questions in the chat uh, straight away as soon as I sort of start, start talking. Uh, that will help us to assess what questions are coming in uh, for us to be able to, to see and respond to those as well as we can. After the open discussion session, we'll have a bit of a more of a presentation from my colleague Agnes with a little bit more information about the implementation uh, monitoring process. In particular, some of the, the key lessons about you know, when to submit, the timing of submissions, uh, and on a few other details. Then we'll turn to a case exercise. The Public Defender's Office of, of Georgia has done some really great Rule 9s uh, over the a long period of time. They've been working on this issue and engaging with this process um, for, for quite a long period. And they'll be talking about uh, their submission that will be made today uh, in the group of Sinsabadze, which concerns torture in Georgia. Then we'll move to a wrap-up session and finally concluding remarks uh, from Lina Laikas. Uh, so for now, just a little bit uh, again to put this in context uh, of, of what we're working on today one of the things we've talked about is how nhris can address implementation ineffectiveness so reforms not perhaps working uh, as well as they should and a key way for that to happen uh, is of course engaging with government but finally in this session we're talking about contributing to the community ministers monitoring process in strasbourg it's really important just to, to put this in context and to say that you know, it's very it's, it's it's very vital for NHRIs to understand the, the conversation that's ongoing between the Council of Europe and national governments before they make submissions to see all, all the relevant uh, action plans and action reports that have put in and to make sure that they put things in at the right time in order to make a contribution to that conversation. Finally, uh, just a, a few comments from from me before we open up the discussion about the most common mistakes that we see when people are writing rule nines. And there's a four, uh, four sets of things there. They echo a lot, I think, what Nico said already in his video presentation. And they're poor evidencing, lack of clear recommendations, poor structure and bad timing. When it comes to evidencing, sometimes uh, NGOs or NHRIs can make submissions where they say, well, you know, the government hasn't made reforms on X or, you know, this, you know the statistics on why are still a problem, and, and but they don't put a footnote in or a reference to where those that information comes from, or perhaps they they won't even make a claim that there's evidence at all. They just say blanketly, you know, uh, uh, elections are still fraudulent in the country or, or something like that, um, and that's you know obviously not sufficient. It's pretty uncommon that we have that problem with NHRIs in comparison to NGOs because NHRIs obviously uh, tend to be more sophisticated or, or not always more sophisticated but the, uh, they tend to never be unsophisticated let's put it like that um, but still it's an important point to note second point i mentioned is a lack of clear recommendations it's so important to finish off the document uh, the rule nine submissions with uh, a very clear set of things that you want to say and you want the committee ministers to do um, sometimes people hope that you know, if it's in the the text of the document uh, that the, the key recommendations or the key actions for the Committee of Ministers will be picked up by the Department for Execution of Judgments or the Committee of Ministers, um, but often that's not the case and it really needs to be set out clearly at the end. And in the example that we'll deal with today, there'll be a good uh, case of that. Structure is also really important. Nikos also mentioned that it's really key just to have a, a, a clear heading for each of the main points that you want to make, again, to make easier reading. Bad timing, this is something that my uh, colleague Agnes will discuss a little bit more. 
it's not very clear sometimes uh, how, when it's best to engage the implementation monitoring process and the timeline can be quite difficult to, to understand from the outside uh, because that's the nature of, of the process um, but it's really important for, for NHRIs to understand uh, that and Agnes will talk a little bit more about that uh, in due course. Um, we're not going to go on to this point quite yet but instead we're going to open up uh, uh, open up the discussion uh, to your questions and your comments. So please do go ahead if anyone would like to come online and make any comments or, or ask any questions to us. Now's the time to do it. You can do so uh, either by uh, just putting your, your question in, in the group uh, chat or indeed by raising your hand. But if there's no one uh, coming in right now, what I might do is just bring in Leonie uh, from the Dutch uh, National Human Rights Institution. Um, I know that she's, Leonie's kindly said that she'll make a short contribution about her experience of engaging with Rule 9. Uh, so Leonie, do go ahead. Well, thank you so much. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for organizing these webinars. I think it's very brilliant and it really helps our work. Um, uh, especially currently we're discussing whether we're going to intervene uh, in a case before the European Court of Human Rights. So it's the, it's not the Rule 9 part, but it's the procedure before that. Uh, but it really helps these kinds of discussions. So uh, first of all, thank you for, uh, for organizing all of this. Uh, and well, personally, I don't have experience with Rule 9s yet. Uh, but I hope someday to have them, uh, but uh, my colleagues do, and uh, it's especially in relation to the Corallo judgment. It was a judgment about the detention the, um, situation in, uh, on St. Marte. St. Marte is uh, a part of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, um, so it's not uh, the European part of the Netherlands, but it's the Caribbean part of the Netherlands. Um, and uh, well, the, well, there was this individual case. It was set by the European Court of Human Rights. Well, uh, the detention si uh, situation uh, in the, the prison was um, not in line with the convention. Um, and then, uh, yeah. So, what did we do in this Rule Nine procedure? Um, well, we indicated that this individual case did not, uh, was not an individual case. Well, it, it was an individual case in that sense, but it was a systemic issue at the, at the prison systems in, uh, in St. Magda. Uh, and in, um, in our uh, contribution and our Rule 9 contribution, we explained what the systemic deficiencies were. We discussed the personal and organizational matters, internal security. So we we kind of explained what kind of issues did we notice that were structural and systematic of nature. Uh, and in that regard, we also relied on general measures put forward in reports by the CPT, uh, the Law Enforcement Council, that's a council especially uh, aimed uh, at um, uh, detention circumstances as well, uh, and a progress report from the Committee of St. Martin. Um, so we, we provided evidence uh, to the Committee of Ministers. Uh, what we also do, did is we visited the, um, the execution department of the, the Council of Europe uh, a while ago. Um, and that actually led that to the fact that they informed us about the, uh, the, this, this case, this judgment and the possibility of uh, intervening. Um, so that was really a nice cooperation, I think, be between the different uh, departments. Uh, and for us, um, uh, it made it easier internally also to get organized and to say, okay, we're going to intervene. Um, and this, this part is also relevant um, at a later stage, to which I will, to which I will come. Uh, but first, uh, what kind of research did we carry out? Well, of course, the desktop research, as I mentioned, we refer to reports. We also had informal talks with representatives of the Law Enforcement Council and other organizations that, that had uh, a clear knowledge of the situation uh, in, in St. Marta. Um, and um, uh, what, 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 we, what we tried to do in, in our submission was we made this uh, recommendation uh, to the Committee of Ministers to explain that this case, because of the systemic and structural 
issues that it raised, it should be under an enhanced uh, supervision procedure. And well, that helps. Uh, so that, that actually works out. So that, that was really great. Um, we did have some problems with the government uh, in the sense that they were not really pleased that we intervened in this case. And that's because of the, the difficult situation in the Netherlands with the Kingdom of the Netherlands. And our institute doesn't have a mandate to uh, work on St. Martin. So the government said, well, you're not allowed to intervene in this case. And so we had to work around that a bit. Uh, so in our, uh, in our Rule 9 submission, we also explained that there were some uh, prisoners from uh, St. Maarten in Dutch detention, so in the European part of the Netherlands, uh, that couldn't be extradited to St. Maarten uh, because of the poor uh, detention conditions. So we had to work around a bit to, to um, yeah, get, uh, get our argument across. Uh, and I think that was also probably the reason that the national of the action plan of, our, of the Netherlands didn't refer to our intervention uh, because there were some uh, <laughs> feelings of uh, us going uh, uh, outside our mandate. Uh, but in the end, and I think that's the most important thing that it is under an enhanced procedure, uh, probably we expect it to be discussed in the CMDH in 2021. And it's all the more important because in uh, April of this year, there were three cases uh, put forward to the European Court of Human Rights uh, relating to exactly the same issue. So um, yeah, there's more, uh, there's more evidence that it's still going on. And uh, we're looking forward to what the Committee of Ministers will say about it. Thank you so much, Leonie. That's that's a very interesting example. Um, two things in particular I wanted to pick up on from what you said. I mean, one is the engagement with the Department for the Execution of Judgments. I think it's worth saying uh, that they're very keen to, to engage uh, with national human rights institutions at, at a high level uh, and foster this kind of uh, relationship. So I, I would encourage anyone else who wants to um, you know, either have a visit to Strasbourg or um, you know, encourage a visit to them in in their own capital. Um, possibly not right now, being the best time, but in the future, I, I I think they are open to that. So yeah. I would encourage you to to get in touch with them about that. And the second issue I wanted to pick up on was um, on the subject of enhanced procedure and standard procedure. I mentioned earlier the kind of list of recommendations, which is, is very important at the end of submissions, and um, often one that that people might miss out on are procedural recommendations. So you know, it's very people often often remember very well obviously to put in their uh, substantial recommendations on the topic the things that need to happen so legislation or, or change in practice but they might forget to make a recommendation to what should happen with the case in terms of procedure so the most important one i would say is, is um, asking for a case under standard procedure to be promoted to enhanced and that's what has been done in this case and it successfully meant that the the case will now be considered by the committee ministers which is a really big difference in terms of the intensity of, of the review. Exactly. Um, yeah. But there's also other recommendations as well that can, can be made, you know, asking that the case be continued under enhanced if it's already there, asking that the uh, committee ministers debate the case as soon as possible, asking for an interim resolution is also another possible option if, if a case has been subject to committee ministers monitoring for a while and there's no process, uh, progress rather. Um, so I think those are all really important things to, to pick up on from what Leonie said. Um, and, and I really thank you for, for that comment. Um, I see also uh, there's a couple of comments in, in the chat. Uh, Gerald has asked for some of the uh, information on some of these cases. And I think uh, my colleague Anya is, is sending that uh, information in the chat. She's referred to the Corallo case um, in Hurok Exec, but perhaps, Anya, you can also send in the National Human Rights Institution's um, uh, Rule 9, the link to that as well, so that uh, people could perhaps take a look at that if they want to. But Leonie, uh, thank you so much. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to add? No, no, it's for us, uh, the, the last comment you made about the procedural uh, comments that you can make, uh, procedural recommendations, uh, that's really useful. And I think also the other versions of uh, procedural recommendations, that's 
new to us. So it would be very helpful if we can get this overview of all the options that we have. So it makes it easier for us to, to pick the right one uh, in the future. So thanks so much. That's a pleasure. And uh, on, on the subject of, 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 of those recommendations, what you can make, I do would refer you to the EIN handbook on, on implementation of judgments. Everything should be set out there um, in, in some of the first pages, I think. There's another question, Leonie, from uh, Eleanor Deeming. So I hope, hope you can stay on the line. Uh, the, the question is, could I ask Leonie what the time slash capacity commitment was for, the, uh, for your team in making the submission? Um, for me, it's a bit difficult to say because I, I wasn't working at the Institute at the moment. Um, but I believe that it was, I think our letter is maybe five pages long, no, yeah, four pages long. So that didn't take that much time to write it out. Um, and because we did already have some information about the situation in St. Martin, that wasn't the most time intensive uh, work. I think it was mainly um, having contact uh, externally with the different organization that took a lot of time and are also uh, internally we always have these discussions we have we don't have just one uh, head of the the institute we have okay we have one head of the institute but beside that uh, we have eight other uh, commissioners who get to decide these issues whether we are going to uh, act upon something so i think internally the the, the decision timing uh, took a lot of time uh, but capacity wise, I don't think it was that much time because we already had uh, the relevant information and experience with the, the detention situation. On the subject of, of time and, and capacity and the amount of time it, it, it takes, maybe that's something also we can bring in uh, Tamar uh, in on, on that subject later. Um, but if there's anyone else who would like to come in to, to help answer that question, do go ahead. Um, I think it'd be really useful for people to know how long it takes uh, NHRIs to, uh, to to write these submissions. So uh, do put that information if you have experience of that uh, in the chat. I think that that will be a really valuable thing to do. Um, okay, but for now, thanks, uh, Leonie. Maybe we'll we'll leave it there. Um, and I see you're, you're, I think you're putting your your contact details in the, in the chat. That's that's very welcome if if people have other other questions. Um, for now, what I think we'll do, though, is pass over to my colleague, Agnes, who's going to continue a bit more of the presentation uh, uh, in regard to the committee minister's process. Yes. So, hello, everyone. I see that uh, Laurent from Belgium also wanted to take the floor. Maybe we'll come back to you uh, later on. Uh, we just have to progress. No, that's fine. Okay, great. <laughs> So I will try to share my screen with you if you give me a second. So, doesn't work. And uh, maybe I could just say while, while Agnès is sorting that, uh, Laurent, if, if you have a, a question or a comment, uh, maybe you could put it in the chat and then I'll, I'll answer it straight after Agnès has, has, has given her section of presentation. Okay, so just put it. Can you see that? Yes, we can. Okay, very great. So what I would like to do today, because a lot have been said already about, you know, uh, what you should consider when writing row nice, I just want to start again with a very short, very, very short reminder about the, the key elements to the process, because when you're writing row nice, uh, you have to get the picture clear in your mind, basically, about whether we're talking about a leading case, a case under enhanced supervision or not, because these will affect also the timetable, the timeline of your intervention in front of the committee of ministers. So just a very short reminder of what we already touched upon during webinar two is where to find the information on your cases. Uh, so you have the link here to the UDOC exact website, where you can find basically the status of execution of your case and also all documents which were which are published sorry in relation to your case so if it was a case under enhanced supervision so a case which is monitored by the cmdh uh, then you will find also the latest cm decision on the case you can also find there uh, the latest action plan 
of the uh, government on the case or the action reports. Uh, that's important because each time when you make a rule nine, as we mentioned before, you need to make sure that you add value in a way. So if you want to add value, if it's, uh, you would have to react, for instance, to an action plan or to an action report. And in terms of structure, it would be important that you really refer to the latest documents <clears throat> published on the case, otherwise there is more or less no point, if you know what I mean. Uh, you can also find here uh, the link to the website from the Department of the Execution of Judgments with some further advice about communications by NHRIs or NGOs. Um, in terms of timeline, um, we were mentioning before, or Leonie mentioned before, that the Corallo, Corallo case uh, might be uh, dealt with in 2021. Uh, as you know, the cases under enhanced procedure are put on the agenda of the CMDH meeting. Of course, they are not put each time on the agenda of each CMDH meetings. You have four meetings a year. And after each CMDH meeting, you can have an indicative list of cases for the next meeting. So it gives you an idea of whether the case will be on the agenda of your next meeting or not. Uh, if it's the case, then uh, it's very important to be aware of that uh, because the delays are normally quite short. And as mentioned by Nikos in his, pop, in his video, sorry, um, it would be important for you to intervene well ahead of this meeting if you want for your comments to be taken into consideration. And what does it mean taken into consideration? It means that if you want to have your submission uh, considered into the notes for the meeting that the department is preparing for the delegates, then basically these uh, submissions should reach the department. Nico says five weeks, we made the experience that six weeks before the CMBH meeting is better. If you send it after that, uh, your submission will be published, will be made published as uh, Nikos mentioned, but it won't be included into the notes for the meeting. And it means for the delegates, they might see it, but they won't be able to come back to their government and uh, you know, talk to them about the input of your NGO. And then it, it won't have such a big impact on the decision um, of a committee of ministers. So that's something which is important to keep in mind. Here again, the link to your doc exec. Okay, uh, I, won't I won't go into details now about how you can add value uh, to your row nine. I think uh, George mentioned that already, as well as, uh, as Nico. So it has to be well construct, constructed, clear, concise, and timely. Uh, I will go over these slides now. What I would like to talk to you now about is more the question of the timeline, because in terms of structure, we will have the example of the, uh, of the colleagues from Georgia. So I will send you this presentation after the event in any case, so we'll have any, enough time to look at our, um, at our advice. Just let me underline here very shortly uh, that the limitations, let's say, of the Department for Execution of Judgments. Um, they have a relatively small staff. You know, there are about 40 lawyers. Not all of them have expertise in all member states' legal system. Not all of them can also you know, understand the language of all member states. They have limited capacity for country visit and they are sometimes, sometimes under the pressure by the member state. So it's sometimes difficult for them also to challenge the claims made by the member states. So be aware of that when you write also your, your own submissions. Why am I underlining that? Because as I as said by Leonie, or as mentioned by Leonie, it's important to also keep in touch with DG directly. And uh, Ian can help you on that. We'll come back to that uh, later on to know exactly what will be, which kind of evidence they are looking for. You know, you must imagine or you must bear in mind that the Department for Execution of Judgments, they receive the action plans from the member states, they receive the action reports, um, and they have to sort out which kind of inf information is relevant to them or not. And they rely also very much on your own submissions, on your own feedback to be able to, you know, to react to these claims. So here, uh, I think we mentioned that in our webinar too, this is the timeline for the overall supervision process. And it gives you an idea of when you can intervene. That's the question of timing for your row 92, which I would like to underline here today specifically. Basically, whether your case is under enhanced procedure or whether it is under the standard procedure, 
the sooner you can inter intervene, the better. So soon after the judgment has been is in finals, it's a new case, you can already make a submission. We had that in the past on some, on some cases to share with the Department for Execution of Judgments what you think should be the measures taken, the general measures taken to implement a case. I'm, I'm, fo I'm focusing here, of course, on the general measures. Uh, but you can also uh, intervene once the case has been classified, so un under enhanced order standards procedure. And what's important to keep in mind is that you should try to keep uh, regularly informed about where the state of execution is, where, how far is, uh, has the case been implemented? Has an action plan been updated, uh, published, sorry, updated an action report, and then to try to react soon right away. And of course, the EAN Secretariat can come support you in monitoring these, this process. So here again, some information about when to best intervene. Following the publication of an action plan, for instance, what you can do is in parallel to your nine, what we mentioned here is also to seek the engagement with the government agent or ministries and participate in working group. That's this combination of Strasbourg level advocacy with the national or domestic advocacy that we mentioned in our previous, previous meetings. So here I put again the six weeks rule before the CMDH meeting for cases under enhanced procedure. For cases under standard procedure, basically they are reviewed by the Department for Execution of Judgments. Uh, but so there, you don't have these uh, rules uh, because they, uh, with a CMDH meeting, because they won't be on the agenda of a CMDH. Um, but it's important to also keep informed, let's say, of, of the progress being made. And we can help us in that. And then of course, each time when you write a rule nine, what's important is also to check the status of the execution once you've done the rule nine. So after the same decision has been taken, if it's a case under enhanced procedure, see to what extent your recommendations have been reflected or watch out for states reply to, to your rule nine. Um, yes, that's what I wanted to say today very quickly because uh, we'll have a very interesting example of the rule nine by our friends from Georgia. So I won't go into more details, but as mentioned, um, the PowerPoint will be shared with you. So thank you very much. I will stop sharing my screen. Yes. Great, thank you so much uh, for that, Agnes. I see a few uh, questions uh, coming in. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think that there's this first one uh, has come in from, uh, I think it's Simona, but it's actually for mm -hmm. Leonie. Uh, and I think Leonie has has answered that in the chat. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, Simona was, was asking another important question in regard to uh, this issue of, of writing submissions. She asked, uh, at what stage did you inform the government uh, and why? If I understand you correctly, your government made some pressure not to make a submission. Did you inform other actors uh, about your intentions? And it would be interesting to see uh, Leonie's re response to that. Um, she wasn't quite sure when, when they made the submission uh, uh, with other actors, we, they already had contacts. I, I just wanted to comment very quickly on, on that question actually, um, because it, it, the one, one downside uh, of, of making rule nine submissions uh, occasionally can be that the governments obviously don't like it when uh, national human rights institutions are you know, um, uh, putting uh, uh, a different point of view for to the government in the international arena. So it can be sometimes be important to try and smooth over that uh, that issue just by making the government aware um, that you're making the submission and to explain why you're doing it um, can sometimes um, be a valuable uh, thing to do. But uh, in addition to that, was there anyone else who wanted to ask a, a question uh, to Agnes or indeed um, uh, to Leonie before I, uh, we move the session on? Okay, Eleanor Deeming uh, has asked, I would like to ask about the possibility of joint rule lines. In the UK, we have a relatively complex devolution set up and have free NHRIs operating. So in cases against the UK, I think joint submissions might be more impactful. Um, thanks very much for that question, uh, 
and uh, it's absolutely possible uh, for joint rule knives to be made. Indeed, it's very common. We see it happen a lot uh, with NGOs uh, joining forces and, and putting in joint rule knives. So I think that's uh, absolutely possible uh, in the case of, of the UK and, and to write a joint submission there um, between different uh, national human rights institutions. ASIL uh, uh, has asked the following, how do we avoid the conundrum of the NHRI's communications to committee ministers from appearing as the NHRI's word against the government's word on the subject matter of implementation? In some ways, there's no uh, uh, magic bullet for that, I, I would say, because uh, ultimately it, it is one um, organization's argument against uh, the government's arguments. Um, so it's, it's not possible to completely avoid that. Um, but I do think it's important, as I said, to try and make sure that contact is continued with the relevant government departments um, before submissions are made. And if possible, also, you know, to, to try and make your points before making the submission um, uh, straight to the government department and, and to say that you're going to engage with the process um, it is also a welcome thing to do. Um, we always try and advise our, our partners in NGOs or indeed national human rights institutions to try and make an input into the process of implementation um, outside of the Strasbourg process, um, uh, straight to, to governments um, before making rule nine submissions, if that's possible um, in, in the timeline. Okay, so I don't see any other questions uh, having come in for now, uh, but for, for the moment, I think we'll thank uh, Agnes so much for, for that presentation, and we'll bring in colleagues from Georgia. So uh, Tamar uh, and Lara, please do come online. I'll be introducing uh, Tamar Abazadze, head of the analytical department um, at the Georgian Public Defender, uh, and also Lara Jawarawli, chief specialist in international human rights law, uh, also at the analytical department. So welcome uh, Tamar, first of all. Hello, good day to all of you. It's a pleasure to see you, uh, Tamar. Uh, perhaps what you could do is, is, is go ahead with your presentation on this case and, and briefly uh, introduce what the work you've been doing. So now we are going to present our new communication in the Tsintsabadze group of cases. Let me just briefly explain what is the case about. Tsintsabadze group concerns by a fail of the authorities to conduct effective investigations into the alleged violations of the right to life and torture and ill treatment by law enforcement officers. Until now, Public Defender's Office has already submitted two communications on this group of cases. The first communication we submitted in 2016, and now uh, the presentation we are going to, pre the, com the new com pre communication we are going to present before you will be third one. Uh, so uh, this will be follow up this new communication will be follow up of this process which we began in 2016. I would like to underline that submitting, com submitting communications before the committee of ministers is long lasting process. This is not just um, one off event. So um, it's not enough to submit only one communication concerning the case. Um, uh, and I think that somehow it is uh, important to push pressure, to put pressure on the government in order to uh, achieve result. And in addition, it's somehow to, it's important to, pre to put pressure on the committee of ministers as well, uh, in a way to persuade them, uh, make our submissions reflected in the committee of ministers' decisions. Uh, so that's uh, very brief. Now I will give uh, floor to my colleague Lara. She will explain how we drafted this new communication, and of course uh, I will be ha very happy to receive feedback on our draft. Thank you for this possibility. Hello, everyone. Uh, I have to apologize because of this technical problem. I will not be able to. I will not be able to uh, connect with the camera. Uh, thank you, Tamar, for the introduction. And thanks everyone for this opportunity. I really believe that these sessions uh, will benefit uh, NGOs and NHRIs to engage more effectively in the Committee of Ministers' Supervision of Execution of Judgments. 
Uh, today, uh, in order to share our experience of drafting Rule 9 submission, um, I will describe the working process on our recent communication in Tinsa about the group of cases. First of all, um, as Tamar noted, uh, this is our third communication with regards to this uh, group of cases because these cases are revealing structural problems of major importance and um, the group is under enhanced supervision procedure. Uh, uh, also, I would note that uh, the committee of ministers decided to end the supervision of two other judgments, uh, where, which we are part of this group. And one of them was Garibashvili uh, versus Georgia, which was the leading case in the group. Um, our Rule 9 submission to the committee of ministers um, is addressing the last government action plan for the Sintabas group of cases as in, and is bringing to the attention mainly issues that are relating to the general measures. So I, I think I can share the communication with you now, right? Uh, is it visible? Yes, we can see that. Yes, it is. Okay. So now, sorry. Yes. So this is our communication. This is first page. I will go, this is just to show you the structure and I will describe the working process. Um, so just to stay on the contents. Um, okay. Um, uh, so in this case, uh, Committee of Ministers um, indicated uh, when the case would be re-examined. So we knew ahead uh, that ideally we had to submit the document six weeks before the meeting or not later than four weeks. But the question of timing to respond to the state's recent action plan was uh, problematic in a sense that when we started the drafting process, the last action plan of the government was published in October 2019. And when we were finalizing the document last week, new action plan was published. So we had to go through and identify what additional issues we are to address. And we spotted one more issue of concern and added information on it. So it's, I think it's familiar for most of NHRIs and NGOs who are working on Rule 9s when uh, during drafting ahead of six weeks, the government's action plan or report uh, is not published maybe. Uh, so uh, as how we put the document together and um, what we are the main sources. Um, so, at, as a first step, we looked at the case description. We, we knew this case, a group of cases, but just to refresh the memory and um, to look through all the documents published, we um, looked at the UDOC exec webpage to see recent developments and concerns which uh, DJ thinks that state representatives should be aware of. Uh, then we carefully went through the Committee of Ministers decisions and notes government's action plans and NGO communication. Um, as a result of this process, we identified the issues of concern and started to look at the evidence in order to assess whether the measures proposed in government's action plan were sufficient. Generally, we provide information and evidence from our own work and uh, latest reports, as well as relevant information documents issued by the international organizations on the discussed issue. Every source is referred with footnotes. Our main sources for the documents were annual parliamentary report of the Public Defender of Georgia of 2019, special report of the uh, National Preventive Mechanism, also from 2019. We also referred to the findings of CPT report. Um, and also we refer to the opinion of Wenis Commission of uh, 2018 with regards to the concerns about the reform of prosecutor's office. Uh, and of course we have uh, relevant articles from Constitution of Georgia, Organic Law and Prosecutor's Office and other uh, legislative uh, 
um, basis that we had to um, discuss. Um, just, uh, just to go through the chapters of our um, communication. So as Tamar said, um, this uh, group of cases concerns uh, challenges with regards to combating torture and in treatment. So this chapter, we started with welcoming the implemented legislative changes in the process of combating torture in recent years, but then we followed with the concerns that we have in this group of cases. Uh, the next chapter, we provided specific information uh, on situation in penitentiary establishments and um, uh, also uh, ill treatment by police officers. Uh, we also referred to the measures regarding the Article 6 violation in one of the cases, which we considered uh, very important to address separately. Uh, we will, of course, share with all the participants the communication so they will have the chance to go through and if they have uh, additional questions or um, are interested, we can, of course, pro provide more information. Uh, also, we mentioned um, separately the urgent need of reform of the Office of the Pub uh, Prosecutor General of Georgia. And as I already said, in this chapter, we referred to the uh, opinion of, of the Venice Commission um, because public defender shares the opinion expressed by the Venice Commission concerning the role of uh, ensuring transparency of the prosecutor's office and so on and so forth. Uh, and um, most importantly, I think we included recommendations of the public defender of Georgia to the government of Georgia. Um, we compiled the recommendations uh, of the um, PDO and uh, we just um, provided the committee of ministers and we are hoping that uh, these recommendations will be taken into consideration and will be reflected um, in the decision. So yes, for now, I think um, I will be glad to answer the questions. Um, yeah. That's great. Thank you so much, uh, Laura. Um, I think if you if you stop sharing your screen, that would be perfect. Um, and, and thank you so much for that presentation. It it, it, it was very clear. Um, and I'd also you know like to reiterate what I said before is that you know, submissions from the, from the Georgian Public Defender's Office have always been very very good, and that's evidenced by that document. You would have seen a, a few things that we've discussed as being really important. Obviously, the, the structure uh, b being very very good, um, the evidence there uh, being referred to in, in the footnotes of, of the Georgian Public Defender's reporting, uh, giving us a strong uh, background to what you're trying to say, and also the recommendations, a very clear list at the end as well. Um, one thing that we haven't discussed, which I, I think you referred to briefly, is um, uh, there were a couple of times in the document where you referred to you know, the positive steps that the government had taken. You, know, you said, for example, that uh, you welcome the fact that uh, the government's national strategy on human rights had uh, highlighted torture as one of the main issues that it wanted to address, and you welcomed the introduction of legislation while saying that it was in, in many ways, in some ways, uh, ineffective in practice. And it's really good to welcome the positive developments that have happened as well in submissions. Uh, that is, is useful for, part of the, for the execution of judgments and it enhances obviously uh, the credit, credibility of the organization making submissions. So I see a, a question uh, from Laurent. Um, Dear Laura and Tamar, what were your thoughts on the possibility to ask for the enhanced procedure on this group of cases? Um, Laurel or Tamar, I'm, I'm happy uh, for you to answer that question. Um, if I may, uh, ahead, this Laura. group of cases is under the enhanced uh, supervision procedure. Uh, we, we didn't take any part uh, in this process. Um, if I understand correctly, uh, Loren uh, wants to know if what was the role, our role, or um, how we could contribute to to including this uh, group of cases 
under the enhanced um, procedure, right? But, but I, I, I think I think you're right to, to spot. I think he was um, not aware that the case was under enhanced already. Um, so I think that that's that's the clear okay. answer. Okay. Yes, all... and uh, yes, this group of cases are under enhanced uh, supervision. Yeah. Yes, exactly. We had uh, no, we, we were not required to think about this because this is under enhanced procedure already. Um, I, I would add that the the only uh, additional procedural comments that you could make in such such circumstances might be to ask for um, an interim resolution uh, from the committee of ministers, um, which is a kind of stronger version of a decision. Um, if if you want to try and uh, put more pressure on, on on the government to act, and if uh, there's a strong case to be made that the government isn't currently making um, uh, realistic progress um, on the case, you can also ask as a procedural issue for the case to be deba debated uh, more regularly or as soon as possible. Um, and, and you can also, uh, if the government is asking for the case to be closed or for the case to be downgraded to standard uh, procedure. It is also possible to say, you know, we submit that the, the case should not be downgraded, it should be kept enhanced, uh, and of course also that it shouldn't be closed. It's not necessary or it might not have been appropriate to make any of those calls in, in this particular case, but I'm just saying those are other uh, procedural comments or procedural recommendations that you can make. Um, Yes, and maybe to come back to what we said before regarding the timing for Rule 9 submissions, we can also very well make some Rule 9 submissions right after the judgment has been final and before it's been classified. So you will find uh, the cases under UDOC exec and it's a new case, so it has not been classified. And you can also make the point, at, as long as it has not been classified, uh, why you would like it to be um, classified as an enhanced uh, case, because it's uh, it raises structural and systemic problems, for instance. I'll just come in again. I think uh, an earlier question was the length of time that it, it takes to, to draft rule line submissions. So perhaps Tamar or Lara, you could make a quick comment about that, uh, the amount of time that you dedicated to this particular submission, or in general, how, lo how long it takes you. Uh, uh, actually, in this case, it took, uh, it took us five days to draft the communication. As I have already mentioned, uh, we have submitted two communi communications before this, communi before this communication, and that's why we were familiar with the case. We already knew the main challenges in this group of cases. So it took only five days just to draft the new communication, text of the new communication. Unfortunately, uh, it's fact that we have not much time for drafting the communications, and that's why uh, we have only just a week uh, to prepare them. Thanks so much, Tamar. Um, I think now we're, we're drawing to the, uh, to the close of, of, of this series of webinars, but if there are any other questions that want to be asked, now's definitely the time to do it. Um, another thing I'd, I'd like to introduce before I, I, I pass over um, to colleagues uh, from the uh, Euro European Network for, for National Human Rights Institutions, I'd love it if you could all just fill in a very, very short um, set of questions that we're going to put up. My colleague Agnes uh, will put a, a, a poll, and that will include four questions with simple yes, no answers, essentially. Um, so hopefully Agnes can, can bring up that poll on your screens now. And it'd be really, really helpful for you to just uh, provide answers to these questions because it will help us understand you know, whether we can uh, provide more support to you. Um, or indeed how the best way is, is for us to go forward on this subject interacting with national human rights institutions. So that would be highly appreciated. As I said, if there's any more questions, do, do go ahead. Um, one thing maybe I can comment on quickly is, is uh, questions raised by Laurent about how the committee of ministers is, is deciding things to come onto the enhanced procedure. This question of standard and enhanced, you know, how do cases uh, go onto standard or how do cases go onto enhanced? Um, it's worth saying that only about a quarter of cases are under enhanced procedure and the decision about that is made by the Committee of Ministers itself under the recommendations of the Department for the Execution of Judgments. Um, so th they often do it on, 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 on the strength of uh, the length of time uh, that cases have been pending, but more often it, it's the perceived seriousness of the violation, I would say, that leads something to be put under enhanced. So that leaves uh, quite a lot of, 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 of discretion on their behalf. 
to decide where cases end up. And it's really important for national human rights institutions and NGOs to make an input into that. And we often see uh, when local national organizations are making the case for something to be put under enhanced, it does go ahead and be put under enhanced. So I think Nikos commented in previous sessions how important it is to pay attention, not just to the enhanced procedure and the CMDH reviews, uh, but also to the standard procedure. Have a look what cases are pending uh, for your country and, 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 and figure out uh, ways in which you can try and prioritize them and get them under enhanced if you think that they're uh, really important and deserve more attention. Okay, so that was the poll. Um, I think now what I'd really like to do is, is hand back over um, to, to Lena uh, Lykas, chair of, of the Henry Legal Working Group. Um, Lena, if, if you're able to, to come on, on board, it'd be great to hear your, your final comments. Um, but for me, I just want to say thank you all so much for participating. For EIN, please everyone just do get in touch with us. My colleague will put in our, our email addresses in, into the chat now. And uh, it'll be very interesting to hear from you. Any way that we can help, we're really, really happy to do so. Um, thank you for your attention. Uh, and, and Lena, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Um... This was most interesting, the whole series, and today I was very interested in hearing the um, practical examples that were highlighted. Um, i just do a quick recap on, we had the four seminars. I don't know if everybody was participating in all the four. Um, there was a lot of information, which I thought I knew, or maybe I knew, but I had forgotten, and uh, new, new examples and very good experiences. We talked about the importance why the NHRs have to be involved or should be involved. And what, what I was shocked was that the 43% of the leading cases are still pending. I mean, I looked through the list of the, my own country, Finland, we have 30 cases, which is a bit of a shocking, but it's mostly due to resource, lack of resources in the ministry. I checked with the government agent and we talked at length about this. 10 of those cases are leading cases. They are all implemented at the national level, but there is like all these procedural things that are still pending. Uh, but it just shows, goes to show you that uh, even countries that kind of think that they are doing things the right way, they still have pending cases. Um, then we also talked about this, how the NHRIs can participate on national level and on the execution level in the Council of Europe. Uh, we talked about the domestic strategies. We talked about how to make the effective submissions today, specifically, and all these practical advices, what to do and not what not what not to do in all these different stages or when conducting the different um, parts of the procedure, the uh, committee of ministers or the execution department. Um, we learned a lot of lessons from uh, different countries examples um interests ways to do things things that have failed maybe or not worked as well as they should have things that have been very 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 good have uh, have had results um so i i think it was very well set up uh it it most certainly i i think for others as well brought a lot of food for thought that how we could do better i mean my office hasn't done any of this officially we are in discussions with the government agent rather regularly on other issues as well we do a lot of cooperation but um we haven't done anything officially and uh, it made me think that maybe we should also think of some cases if there is an issue we should participate i was going to talk about about a case but i will leave it because the case proved to be a bit of problematic with the domestic criminal proceedings and and all kinds of things connected. So uh, I leave that out from here. I, I want to thank of all the organizers, um, the implement, European Implementation Network, uh, the Council of Europe uh, Execution Department, uh, the uh, Entry Secretariat, of course, they are doing a great job always organizing these and helping us understand better these things and improve the situations nationally. Um, also the national presenters, I, I, I have a list of, at least we had presentations from Slovenia, Armenia, Croatia, Greece, and Georgia. 
I apologize if something was left out. Um, and I also, just as the last last few points, I want to say that the, this is not the end. I mean, there will be a further training, further webinars, further developments such as the web page for the implementation. So the, where the NHRIs can find easily uh, instructions or information or guidance on the um, rule nine and good practices maybe from other institutions and also links to resources and so on. So that will be upcoming. I think it was next year. Um, if not already this year, I'm, no, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, then also all these discussions, they are helping helping the processes in improving the system of uh, human rights protection in Europe by feeding into the cdd 8 CISC-5 working group which or drafting group which met last week or week before and which is working on the implementation of the, the judgments and uh, preparing the guidelines for states on the implementation. So NHR, the ENRI and um, individual, now I forget it was Slovenia maybe or somebody who participated in the previous meeting. So, uh, so these discussions help to bring NHRI voices and uh, problems and issues also to this platform at the CDDH working group. Um, and then of course, the further work with the uh, Council of Europe Execution Department and the Implementation Network, European Im Implementation Network, will help us to improve so we can work on more effectively and learn something more and the world will be a happier place or something. I don't know, <laughs> hopefully. Um, so then in the end, I want to thank all the participants with all these discussions. The presentations were uh, very interesting, but the, uh, the, the importance is enhanced by the fact that there are participants who are actually asking questions and bringing their own own experiences and own problems that they have encountered to the floor. So we can all learn from them and maybe not make the same mistakes or we can all think, oh, this is also possible. So thank you all for this. And um, I have nothing further. I'm looking forward for the continuation. And thank you, George, for keeping this all together. And um, the legal working group is always there if, uh, if uh, any people who participated want to participate in the meetings and uh, keep abreast with the um, developments on these issues and other legal issues in the, in the entry area. So thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you so much, Lena. And uh, I wish you all the very best. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.